So a very warm welcome to everybody that is just joining us. I can see you all filing in. So it's a pleasure to introduce this evening uh, WSET School London's webinar on a really kind of close look at the Napa Valley and Cabernet Sauvignon. So just a little housekeeping before we kick off. Um, you can see the chat. Please say hello. Let us know where you're joining from in the chat. There is a separate tab at the bottom for Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please pop those in there. And Catherine will um, go through the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we'll be recording this this evening. If you need to duck out early or miss any of it, it will be available from tomorrow on the WSET School London YouTube channel or via our website um, if you go to the student information tab and webinar recordings. So you can uh, come back to it if you'd like to rewatch it at any point. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Bouguet, who will take you through uh, the Napa Valley. Thank you, Catherine. Terrific. Thank you so much, Lydia. And hello to all the many students at the flagship WSET School London. Um, to we, I know we have a, a lot of hot wine um, conference attendees and everybody who's joining. So happy to have you here. I'm Catherine Bouguet. I'm a co-owner and head of wine education at the Napa Valley Wine Academy. And I received my WSET diploma in 2010 and teach advanced classes like the WSET level three and four. Um, so just thrilled to be here. Whether you're studying or you're interested in exploring more deeply about Napa Valley Cab, Renee and Gustavo are going to demonstrate you know, how natural factors influence their grape growing and winemaking decisions and how this then affects the varying styles of Cabernet made around the valley. Now, don't want to go another minute further without introducing my great colleagues. Renee Airy is Vice President of Winemaking and Duckhorn Vineyards Winemaker. In the winery's four-decade history, she's only the fourth winemaker. She approaches winemaking with a balance between artistry, science, and a deep respect for the viticultural side of winemaking. She guides the entire Duckhorn portfolio and she crafts wines from the many um, AVAs and makes her winemaking choices based on the fruit's origins. So perfect for our discussion today. So hello to, to Renee. Hello, hello everybody out there. Thanks for joining. Sounds like people are joining from all over the world. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Terrific. And then we have Gustavo Avina. He's viticultural director at Pine Ridge Vineyards. In his long career in Napa Valley, he's worked on many top vineyard management programs. He's worked at Newton Vineyards. He's worked with David Abreu. Gustavo has been with Pine Ridge since 2003 and has worked with their numerous you know, estate properties on all many different AVAs. And as such, he knows very, very well. He has a deep understanding of the soils and the climates across the many AVAs. And in, that's, this includes Howell Mountain, which we'll be discussing today. And it's the first vineyard that he actually developed from the ground up. So very exciting. So hello, Gustavo. Hello, everybody. And welcome here and a pleasure to be here. <laughs> awesome. So, so great. Let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I'll start with a quick, quick prelude on natural influences and a very brief trip around the valley. Let's begin with the foundational fact that the vine has certain needs to create quality wine, right? You need CO2, you need heat, sunlight, you need water and nutrients. Um, latitude and climate will dictate some of these things, especially like heat and sunlight and rainfall. Um, but this is only the part, a very small part of the story of any wine region and its wines. Of course, in Napa Valley is a great example of this. Um, it comes with, of course, the Mediterranean climate, which is giving us um, plenty of sunlight and heat during the growing season. However, what ensures that Napa Valley can produce premium wines are the cooling influences that we get here. 
So I know a lot of you have probably heard about the cooling influences from the San Pablo Bay in the south. They bring fog and breezes to the valley. And then we have the many different altitudes, and the, so different elevations and different aspects of the Mayacamas mountain range in the west and the Vaca mountain range in the east. However, what makes the valley even more complex and fascinating is that the effect of these different influences varies around the valley. And we're gonna be jumping into some of that today. So really excited about that. And of course, this affects the different styles of Cabernet Sauvignon wine that we make. So let's start with that brief tour. Um, and we'll start, you know, we'll talk about sort of major factors, major natural factors, and we're going to be tying them to general styles of Cabernet Sauvignon wine before we take a deep dive with Rene and Gustavo into some of these areas. So in the south, you can see it blocked off here, we've got the cooler influence because as you can see with the water in the south, that's the bay and it's bringing those cool influences right to that southern portion of the valley. Um, there are also some western breezes that come across, you know, through Carneros that actually add to this effect. So we've got these nice cooling influences. And while most people don't associate you know, Carneros in particular with Cabernet Sauvignon, um, there are, um, you know, in here, you can see the brown that is the Los Carneros and up, up, you can see the brown extending up into the Mayacamas mountain range. There are warm enough temperatures there to ripen Cabernet Sauvignon. However, here, as well as, you know, in places like Coombsville and parts of Oak Knoll, we really have this great cooling effect that's creating a general style of wine that's fresh, vibrant fruit. We have this beautiful, vibrant fruit with, you know, juicy acidity, bright acidity. So a general style of Cabernet Sauvignon that's different from some of the areas that we'll be talking about. You know, of course, Cabernet Sauvignon has high natural acidity anyway, and these areas only help retain that acidity in the grapes and then the wine. So let's work our way up the Mayacamas mountain range, and we'll start in the south where we find the Mount Veeder. Mount Veeder, a lot of people call the coolest mountain, um, but because it, you know it's the closest to that San Pablo Bay and the cooling influences. It's actually heavily forested. 85% of the AVA um, is forested um, area. But while Mount Veeder has cooling influences, it shares a lot of similarities with Spring and Diamond Mountain to the north. Each has a complex array of altitudes, elevations, aspects, um, which is going to affect things like sunlight and heat, causing the grapes to ripen and develop flavors differently. So even imagine, just even on, on, on one mountain, if you have different vineyards, you're going to have a complex array of different flavors from the different vineyards. And even within one vineyard, you can have many different flavors because of other influences like soils. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna go too deep at the moment. Um, rainfall is high here on the Western area because you have storms that come in from the Pacific and they precipitate over the mountains and sort of lose power as they go East. So that of course is going to influence your grape growing um, as well. While the soil's different in general, you've got marine soils, you've got volcanic soils. Um, we won't deep dive too much into, into soils right here the Napa Rocks program by the Napa Valley Vintners was great for that. Um, but we do have some shared features in the mountain areas, which is thin soils that are less fertile. This, of course, is going to produce berries that are smaller. And with the smaller berries, you've got a larger skin to juice ratio. And what that does is provide for some good tannins, some nice firm tannins in the wines, amongst other things. Um, so just something that creates nice age worthy, you know, tannins, and that's going to affect the style of the wines from here in the mountain, where we've got firm tannins, high retained acidity, and then these just complex, you know, beautiful flavors um, from the mountain soils. So here we have, you can see blocked off here, you know, the um, Diamond and Spring Mountain. But let's go across the valley. Let's continue with the mountain AVAs. So we'll go down uh, the Vaca range. And here we have, um, 
you know, elevation is also influencing the temperatures here, but there'll be the less rainfall than in the Mayakamas mountain range, as I mentioned. This will only intensify the flavors that we find here in the mountain range because there's less influence of that rainfall. We'll be exploring Howell Mountain in particular in a few minutes. Both Rene and Gustavo have estate vineyards there, so we're going to go into a deep dive. There's just too many stories and micro details, you know, that we, we won't be able to share today, um, but I'll pause for just a minute. You know, interestingly, you can see this Atlas Peak here, you know, it's one big rock. And, you know, in the 1800s with the first plantings there, they used dynamite to break up, you know, the rock. And the very first winemaker on Atlas Peak, his name was Romain de Boom. You just can't make up these stories. Um, it's just so great. Um, anyway, but just below, um, let me give a point about just below Atlas Peak, you see Stag's Leap. And Stag, Stag's Leap is a great example of the incredible complexity that comes with the valley. Because while you see its location here and you expect warmth, which it has, there's actually a series of hills that run parallel to the Vaca Mountains. And so the breezes that come up from the south are funneled through there, giving some beautiful breezes in the afternoon. There's so many little macro and micro details like that, you know, along the valley. And of course, we'll be exploring some of those. But let me go to the valley floor. So now we're going to be talking about places like Yauntville, Oakville, and Rutherford, two of which we're going to go into quite deeply um, today. Um, so when we talk about the valley floor, one of the main differences we have, you know, is that we have more fertile soils here. Um, and generally, while we have fog influence that comes up through Yauntville, Oakville, and into Rutherford, it's generally less so, of course, than in the south. It just depends on where you are. You're going to get some beautiful cooling effects, you know, from the, from the fog in certain of these areas and the breezes as well, depending on where your vineyard is, is going to help retain those acidities in the wines. And we're going to be exploring that at some depth. Now, I didn't mention, you know, we'll just mention it briefly, although, you know, that Napa Rocks program talks about it more. But in this area also, there's some famous benches. And what we mean by that is think of a bench, you know, and if you're sitting on the bench, it's sort of you're sitting going up towards the back of the bench. Well, that's going up towards the hills is the benches and the benches, their soils are even a little different, right? They have soils that come down from the mountains. You've got nice rocky, you know, rocks that settle at the base of the mountain. And so the soils are sort of in between the less fertile mountain soils and the more fertile valley floor soils. So the wines there just have great fruit forward, you know, um, flavors, but a little less tannin than in the mountains. So just, just another uh, amazing um, difference here. But we're gonna come back to this area, exploring Oakville and Rutherford in particular in a minute. Let me just finish off, Gustavo and Rene are being very patient, just finish off with the um, northern part of the valley. And so here we're going to have some nice warm temperatures, St. Helene and Calistoga, yet as I've been um, discussing the complexity here, too, up here, and I included the picture, you know, on the screen, you've got fog that comes in through breaks in the mountain range up in the north as well. There's the Chalk Hill Gap that comes in, you know, through there, through that break in the coastal mountain range. And it can bring great fog and breezes also from the north. Um, so another thing to, to consider. In fact, those breezes have such a great effect that you know when I sit with one of my my um, good friends, he you know, has a vineyard on Lower Howell Mountain, and that breeze comes through in the afternoon. So you can sit outside in the hot summer temperatures and feel that beautiful breeze. We joke around that we're at the Chalk Hill Gap group just because of that that awesome breeze lets us sit outside in the summer. Uh, anyway. Um, I want to now start to deep dive into one of the AVAs that we're going to be discussing today. So we're going to start with Howell Mountain. Um, and as I mentioned, Rene and Gustavo both have estate vineyards up here on Howell Mountain. So let's talk about a little bit, I'll prelude on Howell Mountain, um, testing their patience just a little bit more and talk about the area before they jump in. 
Um, so when we talk about Howell Mountain, we're talking about an Appalachian, an AVA that starts at 1400 feet. So if you're on the mountain, but your vineyards fall through that, you're likely putting Napa Valley AVA, you know, on your wine bottle. So Howell Mountain, the boundary begins at 1400 feet. So that means there's going to be some, you know, that area is above the fog level. You're going to have some extra sunshine shun hours during the day. Uh, and daytime temperatures at this altitude, of course, are going to be lower, but the evenings stay warmer. So what this does is you have a um, more even diurnal, you know, there's less of a diurnal temperature swing. And remember, diurnal temperature swing is the difference between day and nighttime temperatures. And so generally in Napa Valley, because of the fog and the breezes, we've got a big diurnal temperature range, but in the mountain areas, it's less so. So just keep that in mind as one of the factors we're talking about. So you have what this results in is more consistent ripening. So everything ripens at the same time versus the height that, you know, heat spikes versus the cold um, that the, that yin and yang that you can get. So Howell Mountain and the other mountains in Napa Valley can get frost, you know, for any, any of you level three students out there who, you know, you're learning about, you know, altitude and how frost sinks to the lowest point. And you're thinking, what are you talking about, Catherine? Well, here, Howell Mountain is not actually a mountain with a peak. It's a lush forested plateau. And so that's why when we talk to Gustavo, we're going to be talking about frost and things you can do in the vineyard against that. And of course, we discussed about the mountain areas having that thin, less fertile soils. And Gustavo and Rene are both going to bring in things that they do in their grape growing and winemaking because of the grapes that result from that. Okay, speaking, speaking again about Gustavo and Rene, I'm gonna turn now to Gustavo. So Gustavo, I know this AVA has a very special place in your heart, you know, given that it's the first that you went ahead and farmed from the ground up. When we talked earlier before this session, you mentioned that it's the coldest AVA, you know, that you farm. So can, can you tell us about it? Tell us about the climate here and how that generally affects your grape growing, your decisions. Yes, as, as you went through all different AVAs in Napa Valley, I mean, we know Napa Valley is not a really big area. I believe it's like 20, 21 miles long. And, and we had a, a lot of microclines from different areas, a lot of different soil types. And that's one of the things that I really like from my job that I, I have different challenges depend, depending on which ABA, we are farming, um, and I have to do different activities for each vineyard, for each VA, so it doesn't become boring for me, like uh, doing the same thing for each vineyard. So yes, Howell Mountain to me is one of the coolest areas that we farm, and because it's in a plateau, there is a lot of frost risk in the area. We have to run wind machines in there that the, the way that we prepare to do that is delayed in pruning because the later that you prune a vine, the later that you had the bud break. So that's, that really protects for frost, but, for frost. But also by doing that, that's one of the vineyards where we ended to harvest last because the season got longer than there. So we had to delay pruning to do that. Also, just to see the difference, we had wind machines in the vineyard there. A, a wind machine normally covers 10 acres in a regular vineyard sites. We have eight and a half planted acres in this property, and we had three wind machines in there. It's basically one wind machine for every three acres in that property, while another was, as I say, is like 10, 10 acres for, for wind machine. Also, uh, we need to protect the vineyard for frost early in the spring, but also before harvest. We can have damage before harvest, and actually it happens. Uh, I believe it was 2010 where there was a big frost just before harvest, and a lot of our neighbors lost their grow because of frost. Luckily, we were on the property, and we turned our wind machines, and we protected. 
I have seen frost on that property as early as September 16. I mean, it, it seems crazy, but um, it's, it's called the difference in temperature between one area to another one. Then in the summer, wherever we have a warmer days, and because we are about the fog, about 1800s, about the fog, the temperatures remain, remain warm through the night. So that helps a little bit to catch up with the rest of the, of the valley in, in terms of the growing season. So due to that, because it's a little bit warmer, we decided to automatize the irrigation in there. So that way we can irrigate at night with less evaporation happens. So we have a system where I can irrigate from my house, from with myself, with my computer, I can just set up irrigation. And we do that to the night, most of the time. So we avoid evaporation of the water. So the mine utilize more the water that we apply. So that's one of the big benefits that we have. And believe me, after we start doing that, I will say this is the best fruit that we can bring to the winery right now. Mm. It's a beautiful, a beautiful, fruit coming from that vineyard. I love that. I love that. So great. So you've tied these sort of, you know, this cold spring, you know, temperatures to frost risk. You've tied the hot summer temperatures, right, to water availability and, and irrigation, you know, and I love hearing the, the, the details just as, you know, delaying pruning because that will delay the bud burst. And then you don't subject those young, beautiful, you know, buds to the frost. I mean, just the, the detail and everything you have to think about is, is incredible. Um, so fascinating. Can, can you tell us about the soils, um, Gustavo, in your, in your vineyard and how this affects your farming? Yeah, the soils are completely different than the valley floors where there are rich alluvial soils which require more crop thinning, more canopy management be, to control vine vigor. Here we are constantly making soil and tissue analysis to see what the vine needs because there is some ash volcanic tough soils which are very rich in minerals but low in nutrients. And by doing those tissue analysis and soil samples, we know what the vine needs and we end up to apply uh, foliars like manganese, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium through the foliar sprays. And also we apply a lot of campus tea to the irrigation. Campus tea, I see a lot of benefit from that because it, it can stay like uh, custom worms. And to me, applying campus tea to the ground is like a returning life to the, to the ground. And it goes directly to the roots of the vine. So by, by doing that, I have seen a lot of difference in the, on the vine, like darker green colors on the leaves and also, we have significantly seen a lot of reduction in water by applying campus tea. Mm. Oh, so even the vineyards get a tea break. I love it. Yeah, we do that. <laughs> well, this, <laughs> well, this is really insightful, Gustavo, because advanced students, you know, especially, they require an understanding of sort of soil structures effects, you know, on nutrient availability and, of course, water availability. Um, so once again, it sort of exemplifies how natural factors here, the soil, are going to affect the different grape growing options, you know, that you employ. Um, I, I just, I find this stuff fascinating. So let me go ahead, you know, I didn't show, um, I'm remiss, mm. I didn't show you your vineyard, you know, here, um, um, Gustavo. Um, so pardon um, that, but I'm going to move off to Renee. Renee also, you know, um, brings in fruit, has an estate um, on Howell Mountain, and here is Duckhorn Stout Vineyard. Um, Renee, we look to your expertise to tie natural factors on Howell Mountain to general grape characteristics and thus winemaking, you know, options that you then employ. And I know when we spoke before this session, because there's hundreds, maybe thousands, you know, of things you have to consider when it comes to, um, you know, cellar um, techniques. Um, you decided on, on honing in on three of them and you'll repeat these three through the different areas that we discuss. And so I know you chose um, juice chemistry and must adjustments. You chose extraction and tannage management and you chose uh, um, oak treatment and aging. Um, would you tie some of the natural influences we've been discussing, you know, to what you see in Howell Mountain from the great characteristics and then, you know, what you, you know, choices you make in the cellar? Absolutely. 
absolutely. Yeah. Like, uh, like Gustavo, um, we work with a lot of different ADAs at Duckhorn. And so it's always so cool to see how every vintage is different. And every a ABA has um, has these little subtle differences or in some vintage big differences. And it's neat to kind of work with all those different areas and kind of see what they do um, each year. But Hell Mountain is, is by far one of my favorite ABAs to work with, similar to Gustavo. It's just, it's so different. Um, our Stout Vineyard has similar soils and microclimates to the Pine Ridge uh, State Vineyard. It's located about 1,900 feet elevation. And with that inversion, those warmer nights and cooler days, uh, the pHs are going to be on the, higher on the mountain than they are on the valley floor. So what that does is with fruit coming into the winery, is it, it prompts a larger atmospheric adjustment for us at Crush. Um, and we don't always do acid adjustments, but in this case, we will. And our post-press pHs, um, typically for our high mountain fruit, tend to be in the range of about 3.7 to 3.85, whereas a lot of the time you'll see uh, much lower numbers on the valley floor. will be more between 3.55 to 3.6 and up to 3.7. So um, there's definitely a difference there. But ultimately, with those smaller berries and thicker skins and bigger tannins, um, I have to be extra mindful of extraction <coughs> on our compound wine. So uh, all of our wines get two pump overs a day. But with our Hell Mountain fruit, what I'll do is I'll go a little bit longer um, on the pump over timing at the beginning of the fermentation when there's less alcohol present. So you're kind of limiting that extraction um, from the, out, the presence of alcohol. And then as the timing progresses, uh, the fermentation progresses, we'll kind of shorten the pump overs once I hit about 12 bricks. So kind of, again, just looking at uh, extraction and seeing how that plays into the mix because ultimately with these really big tannins and, um, and a lot of concentration coming off the mountain, you have a tendency to over extract on these wines. So the other thing that I keep in mind on our how mountain wines is just how we introduce air into the fermentation. And so I like to introduce oxygen early on with our how mountain wines. And it's really just to help finesse those big rugged, rugged tannins. So whether that's through a, you know, a tub and screen or a venturi, just an easy way to kind of get some oxygen into those wines early on and kind of help starting the process with refining a little bit. And then along those same lines, because of the intensity of tannins and concentration of fruit, the Hell Mountain wines, they lend to amazing ageability. These are some of my favorite wines to put in the cellar and 30 years later, they are gonna show absolutely incredible. So because of that, we will barrel age our Hell Mountain wines for 24 months which is six months longer than what we do for our Valley Floor wine. And then on top of that, we'll do an extra year of bottle age time. So, uh, so that extra you know, 18 months of time is really just gonna help with that evolution of tannins, the integration. So when you open your first bottle, it's, it's amazing. But ultimately we'll do 18 months. Uh, the first 18 months in barrel will be in 100% new French oak. And then we'll follow that with six months of 100% neutral oak. And it just has this really nice balance and allows uh, great ageability with these wines. Great. That is such incredible detail. I think we're all going to have to go back and watch the tape version, you know, of this of this webinar, um, um, so that we can we can um, re hear it repeated. But just incredible, and I love just the connection, you know, of tannins in particular, you know, these mountain tannins that you have, and then what you then employ in the cellar, um, and then also just the detail, because even at the level three, uh, I know there's a lot of diploma students, um, you know, here today with us, but even at the level three. You're, you're learning that, hey, when you're, you know, when you talk about, you know, maceration and extraction of tannins, you know, it just, um, there's less, it's more color and flavors that are coming out when you do it pre like a cold soak. But during fermentation with the heat and the, you know, alcoholic solution, then you have more tannin and um, extraction. So just anyway, just fun, great details. Um, what do you then expect, Renee, from the style, you know, of wine? And of course, I know there's many different factors, but just sort of the general style um, that people can hear about a Howell Mountain wine. Sure. Our, our Howell Mountain wines are some of the most distinct in my portfolio. Um, they drive a lot of concentration, the complex, firm, rugged tannins with that high elevation. It really kind of drives those like rugged mountain tannins. Um, but then also we always see this really wild fruit profile, which is really neat. A lot of like 
boysenberry, blackberry, huckleberry, but more of those kind of brambly notes coming through. And then because the soil up there is a little bit richer in minerality, you'll see that translated into the wine as well. So you'll see the minerality, the spice, and the savory notes coming through. So Sounds these are delicious. Really complex, uh, intense wines. That sounds delicious. Uh, Gustavo, I know you have your, you know, Howell Mountain wine and you, you talked to me, you know, about, you know, your wine as well. Do you, do you want to say, uh, you know, a few thoughts on yours? Yeah. So at you know, Pine Ridge, we, we make wines from five different AVAs. Like we make wine from Oakville, Rutherford, Staxley, Howell Mount, and now Carneros. We make Cabernet Sauvignon for North those five AVAs. Mm -hmm. For everybody, unless you're at Pine Ridge, they know how a month is my favorite wine. That's a lot of going into that, my personal <laughs> thoughts about that, because to me, drinking a wine from Howell Mountain, I, it always came to my mind the property, the trees around, the sun of the wind, the woodpeckers over there in the, on the forest. And, and to me, the wine is one of the, that has bigger structure from all Pine Ridge wines which has more tannins. Um, the color is really dark and very small berries, very small clusters, which has a lot of concentration. So that's uh, a bigger structure, definitely. It's a bigger wine for me, and, and I really love that. <laughs> that's great. That, that one sounds amazing, amazing as well. Well, let's go ahead and move off to our second AVA that we're going to be discussing, and that's Oakville. And when we talk about Oakville, if you recall, you know, this we're talking about um, an AVA that lies on the valley floor, mostly. <laughs> Bear with me as I explain. Um, when we talk about Oakville, you may have noticed on the Napa Valley AVA map, you know, that when the AVs, AVAs were created, you know, they separated out mountain AVAs from valley floor AVAs. So they were carved out separately. The regulating body, though, the ATF, decided that with Oakville, they'd extend that AVA up on the east up to 1,006 feet. And they did that because this area is just an uplifted, you know, from volcanic activity. This was uplifted, having the same exact soils as the valley floor. So they made that adjustment in that usually separate valley floor from mountain delimination and allowed this um, in Oakville. You know, when I show this um, to my students, I like to joke around, you know, do these boundaries make my AVA look fat? Um, but anyway, uh, let's go ahead to some of the um, unique qualities that we'll find, you know, here in Oakville. It's a transitional mid-valley location here in Oakville. And what that means is in the south of the AVA in particular, you will still get the influences of the fog. Um, but the area generally is going to get the full effect of the warmer afternoon sun. So we're going to expect that heat and that ripeness here. There are, however, afternoon bay breezes that come in from the south and also down from the mountains. So a lot is happening. A lot is happening here. And I, and I know Gustavo and Rene are going to touch on this. Um, as well as the east and west are quite different. In the east, there's these mineral rich volcanic soils which have washed down from the Vaca, you know, mountain range. And, and I know there's many different types of volcanic soils and they all have their different pluses, but generally there's low fertility here. Um, and that's going to encourage small berries with nice concentrated fruit here as well. In the West, we've got these alluvial soils. And when we talk about alluvial soils, those are soils that have come down a mountain stream and settle at the base of a mountain. And so those soils can be nice and rocky. You know, we, dis we discussed the, the bench soils, you know, earlier. And you're going to have, you're going to have some of the great draining soils, by the way, but you're going to end up having some nice ripe flavors in those wines, you know, it, but the tannins won't be as, you know, aggressive as um, some of the mountain areas. But um, I'm going to let I'm going to let uh, introduce Gustavo's vineyard here uh, and let him um, um, talk about this. I think this is your Dos Olivos uh, vineyard, Gustavo. What different techniques and considerations do you make um, in Oakville? Yeah, Dos Olivos is a, it's a vineyard that isn't 
the ABA and Oakville in general is, is warmer. It's a warm, like 90 degrees and average all the times. A lot of sun exposure on this specific vineyard, since the morning to sunset, it is always exposure to the sun. So due to that, we had to do canopy management a little bit different, especially on those roads where we don't have a, a perfect road orientation. So we had we had few blocks there where where the fruit received the afternoon sun directly to the clusters. So we had to manipulate like growing more laterals on the afternoon sun side just to create some type of shade in there to avoid uh, sunburn. You mentioned you mentioned a preferred row orientation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I really like uh, and the new blocks that I am planting. I use in I use in northeast southwest. So the sun at the time the fruit is ready is running pretty much over the row. So doesn't cause the sunburn that he causes and the other row orientation that I have. Yeah, northeast southwest is my preferred orientation. Um, okay, so great to consider, you know, that as well. Um, but let's go back to Renee. So Renee, can you tie some of these influences we're discussing to great characteristics again in winemaking choices that you're making? Yeah, yeah, we, um, our vineyards in Oakville um, are on kind of the Eastern Mid Valley side. So they're definitely a little, little bit more of those transitional vineyards that you were referring to. And um, with the fog in the morning and the afternoon breeze, we, we typically see really good acid retention in our Oakville fruit. Uh, so this really allows us to back off on those acid adjustments at the mud stage. And the resulting wines typically have much lower pHs than up on Cal Mountain, which is really nice. Uh, our vineyards like Gustavo's see a lot of sun exposure. We have um, quite a few different row orientations as well. And, and some of them are not ideal. You get a lot of that wet facing sun. Um, and so I have to be extra mindful of picking decisions and obviously shrivel in that scenario. And so um, so for any rows that have kind of that heavy west facing side in the, in the afternoon, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a, a split uh, pick or I'll kind of shoot for the middle ground knowing that the west side is going to be a little bit riper, the east side is going to be a little bit um, less ripe and kind of find that middle ground, that, that little bit of balance there, and I'll kind of pick it up that time. Um, so being kind of more towards the eastern side of Oakville, some of our vineyards have heavier soils, and so they just show less density. So what I do with those wines is um, I like to do a three-day cold soak, um, and we'll do that at 45 degrees. That's pre, uh, pre yeast add, so pre-fermentation, and it really helps build up the mid palate. Um, this is something that uh, cold soaks are traditionally known to help stabilize color, and um, but they're a great tool for building mid palate and texture and weight in the wine. So I started doing those on all my Merlots in 2007, and, and now we use them on some of our um, heavier kind of soil area Cabernets. So uh, typically our Oakville fruit has, has good concentrated fruit in firm resolved tannins, as long as the vintage isn't too warm. And so we don't necessarily need to give these wines as much, as much oxygen up front. So, um, and then uh, our Oakville wines are made at 50% new French oak and they're aged for 16 months, which is less oak than Hell Mountain and a, a, a shorter aging time. And this really just allows the fruit to shine through and still have enough support and framework for um, complexity and long-term ageability. And then the other, the other thing I like to do with my Oakville wines is that um, I use the slow and low toasting and what that does is it kind of enhances a little bit of sweetness in the palate and, and creates breath in the wines, which is just really nice for the, the heavier soiled areas. Mm, well, that sounds delicious. Um, but, you know, from what I'm hearing, you, there's quite a, a lot of differences on what you're doing, you know, with tannin management, with your oak treatment, you know, between Hollow Mountain, you know, uh, and here in Oakville. I just find this, I just find this incredibly fascinating. Um, can you, can you sum this up, um, Renee, with just, you know, some thoughts? I know that it's very different from east to west in Oakville, um, but just a sum up of a general style of Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon. Sure, sure. Yeah, our Oakville wines typically show a mix of riper red fruits. Um, so maybe like riper cherry, currants, we do see some black fruits. The texture is generally pretty rich. And then depending on the vintage, you'll kind of see 
some subtle differences in the body, but definitely that brighter acidity coming through from, like I said, that, that morning fog and that afternoon breeze just really uh, allows for good acid retention in the Oakville wines, and it really comes out as a nice bright. So just more affirmation about that, those natural influences that fog and breeze is making all the difference in helping retain this, this bright acidity in the wines. Uh, I love this. Um, okay, so um, I get excited at the geeky things. So let's go ahead and move off to Rutherford, the third area we'll be talking about today. And we'll finish up here in Rutherford. What I think is fascinating is it's just north of Oakville. So they share a boundary yet even here, we're gonna be showing differences in grape growing and winemaking. So I think this is a fun you know, choice to have. Here we've got, I'll just turn off to the, to, the, to the picture so you can look at the picture instead of the map. But the fog you know, also can seep into the Rutherford area, but it's slightly warmer here. You know, Gustavo and Renee are going to discuss things like the soil and the elevation differences that even you know, appear here. So Gustavo, let's start with you again, please. Uh, and now we're seeing this is Pine Ridge's Rutherford Ridge Vineyard. Um, can you touch on, on sort of climate or macro and micro climate uh, and the soils here and what you now, you know, employ differently in Rutherford? Yes, this vineyard is in general a little bit warmer than Oakville and how Mount occurs. And we, we still had the benefit of the marine fog in the mornings, but uh, it's still, it's, it's kind of one of the warmest areas, probably. And in this vineyard, we have two different types of soils. We had, a, in the vineyard, we had a flat area, and then we had hills there. And the soil type from one to the other one is very different. For example, in the, on the highs, on the, the picture that you see is on the very top of the hill there. So the, the soil is bay clay loam, which has a lot of rocks and drains very easily. So irrigation there, we, we need to manipulate very carefully. We have to irrigate, I will say, compared to the valley floors, less water, but more frequently to be able to keep some moisture around, around the root zones while end up and the flats of the property, we have a really heavy clay soils, which has a lot of holding water capacity, but also that clay retains the water and doesn't get the plant to absorb much of that. So we had to do deep irrigations with bigger amounts of water, but uh, with longer, longer period of times, with longer frequencies. So, yeah, the heavy clays are a, a bit different. We need to do cover crops in those areas to two different reasons. For example, in the hills, we grow cover crops based on grasses that helps to hold the soil to avoid erosion problems. While in the flats, we plant a lot of legumes like uh, alfalfa, pea beans, and all common veg, all those legumes that we mow and till and incorporate to the soil to give a little bit more nitrogen to the, to the vines. So that's, uh, that's way different to, ma to manipulate one area from the other one there. I just, you know, here, I mean, soils, even in, in one AVA, right, with the, the, the differing soils, you have to employ the different irrigation techniques. Um, yes. You have and, those gravelly, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, and, 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 and due to that, also, we, we have a sun soil sensor moisture on the ground, and we also have a sensors that read evapotranspiration of the vines to determine irrigations. Like in the, in the valley floors, we have those soil sensors, and the hills, we have the evapotranspiration sensors. And basically, those sensors are telling me how much, the, how much water the vine used through the day, how much water apply back to the vines. So we have to combine those tools to determine irrigations. So such such detailed information that's informing your your decisions. You know the options that you have. You know in, in your grape growing. Uh, I think that's great. Well, Renee, if we can go off um, to you and and talk about you know given it's slightly warmer here, what characteristics do you see here with the Rutherford fruit that you deal with, and thus you know the the different techniques you'll then employ in the cellar. 
Um, our Rutherford Vineyards are on the eastern side um, of the bench there, so a little bit further over than where Gustavo's Vineyards are. And then with, with Rutherford being slightly warmer than Oakville, we will see those higher sugars. Um, so the bricks will creep up a little bit more and, um, and then lower also acidity. So it'll require an acid adjustment and a water adjustment at the must stage. Um, that's pretty typical for us. Mm -hmm. The tannins are generally firm, but they're more polished than Oakville and Howe Mountain. They're a little bit more giving, um, kind of round and fine grain. And so we can typically ferment warmer with those wines than we do with um, our, our Howe Mountain wines. And then we can also press a little bit harder without risking over extraction, which is, which is nice. So our Rutherford Cabernet, um, it's also aged for 60 months at 50% new French oak, um, similar to what we do for Oakville. Um, but I can use more impactful barrels on these wines to kind of enhance that structure and build up a little bit more of that framework because the fruit there is just so giving, so expressive. It can handle a little bit more tannin to kind of um, help set the framework for those wines. Just, a, just again, you know, just incredible, you know, detail and what you do that, you know, is different. Could you once again for us just sum up you know, just, a, you know, sort of a general style of Rutherford wine for our audience. Yeah, our Rutherford Cabernet is typically really fruit forward. It's one of the most fruit forward and kind of plush um, fruit expression wines that we have in our portfolio. There's always a mix of blueberry, blackberry, with black cherry that kind of peeks through, um, currants, so a lot of different types of fruit. Um, so it gets really complex, really um, layered. And then the palate's full body. And those tannins are round, they're supple, they're polished. They're there and certainly present, but they just have a little bit more of a rounder, fine grained feel to them. Mm -hmm. That's great. Good. Thank you so much. Well, we have we have so many things that you know we discussed already today. We have the mountain fruit where we have the firmer tannins and the highly concentrated fruit flavors from the smaller berries um, with great complexity of flavor and retained acids, you know, from, from the altitude. Uh, and on the valley floor, you know, while we have those two, you know, AVAs that are close to one another, we have differences yet again. Oakville with its ripe fruits, rich texture, bright acidity, and Rutherford with its full-bodied fruit forward, you know, cabs and su supple tannins. Um, I mean, the valley's just great diversity, you know, here with the varying altitudes and aspects and, you know, the, the extent of the fogs and the breezes and the soils. And it's just really, you know, uh, leading to an array of different Cabernet Sauvignon styles here. You know, I find it fascinating enough, um, but also for all of you students out there who are studying, you know, I hope too that you gain some insight from this so that you can better answer, you know, you'll have exam questions questions like, you know, describe grape growing and winemaking options for Napa Valley Cab, or, and we're starting to make some of you nervous, um, you know, or how do factors in the vineyard and winery influence the style and quality of Cabernet Sauvignon? Um, so these are questions that diploma, you know, students are, are faced with and probably in other programs uh, as well. So I'd love, I see that there's all these um, um, Q and A's coming in. Um, so if, if I'd like to now open it up to some of these questions. Um, so let me look here and see what's coming in. Um, we do have a question about Gustavo, um, a question about your compost tea. Can you explain a little bit more? Is, is it a, you know, a liquid you know, compost? Yeah, it comes in a liquid form and it's made here locally in Calistoga. So yeah, they, they put compost on the brewer and then put custom grounds on it and we get it from then and we have 24 hours to apply that into the soil because remember, this has live organisms on it and we apply that to the irrigation. So when we get it from there, 24 hours is the maximum. Other ways, the custom grounds will, will be dying in there. So that's a very useful uh, thing to use in the, in the, on the soil. Good, thank, thank you for that, Gustavo. I do see several, several people asking sort of the same um, question. So maybe I'll, I'll um, ask Renee to answer this one, but you know, are these three areas mostly Cabernet Sauvignon or are there other red varieties or even any whites grown here? 
Hey, um, Catherine, just if we could take a moment before I dive in to answer that question. I've been seeing some chat pop up saying that people are having a really hard time hearing me and I just wanted to check in. I, I changed a few of my settings and I was wondering if, if that's any better at the moment. And I Thank apologize, you. I'm not sure. You know, for me, it was just a little tinny, but I could hear you clearly. So let's just see if we're getting any, um, let me look at the okay. chat. It looks like I'm seeing some come through and it looks like- Okay, just move a little okay. bit closer to the mic. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, we um, these AVAs are certainly known for great Cabernet, but we have a lot of other varietals grown in those uh, regions as well. So uh, up on Hell Mountain, I have Rones up there. I have Zinfandel. I have uh, the rest of the Bordeaux varietals as well, and they do excellent. Um, Oakville and Rutherford also have white varietals grown there. There's a lot of other Bordeaux. So um, it, being such a diverse, like within the AVA, and then obviously the scope of Napa, there's just so much diversity. Sometimes even within the same vineyard that you could have, you know, cab growing on one side, Syrah on the other, and Sauvignon Blanc there, um, which is really kind of the, the neat part about growing wine and making wine in Napa Valley. It's just, it's all that diversity. There's so many, so many differences. So yes, we do, we do grow a lot of other varietals there as well. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I love that. And just, you know, when you start to explore the valley, I mean, you even realize that, you know, there's, um, you know, an oak knoll, there's this beautiful Riesling up on Spring Mountain, there's this beautiful Riesling, you know, being grown. In fact, historically so, in the 1800s, um, the Beringer brothers, you know, grew Riesling up there. There's so many great stories and, 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 and whatnot to, um, to share. I know we sort of top lined it today. Um, but let me just see what other questions are coming in. Um, I know that we're, we're being asked for, you know, the maps that were included in the presentation today. Just know that, you know, the Napa Valley Vintners has a wealth of information on their site. And so you can find, um, you know, maps there if you look for the, the Napa Valley Vintner. Um, site, which also has that Napa Rocks program um, that I mentioned to you, where you take, you know, because so, there's so much going on here geologically, you've got bedrock that then that's affecting the soil. There's so much you can learn. And again, in Napa Rocks, and I do see that there's a question too on just, ah, how could we ever, you know, the, the, the area of Napa Valley seems so incredibly complex. Is there any place we can go? One of my, so I'll just share one of my, you know, favorite books um, from um, Swinshat and Howell, The Winemaker's Dance. Um, I just love this, Exploring Terroir in the Napa Valley. But it's a geeky, it's a geeky dive. Um, but I think it's just an, an incredible, incredible book. So let's see, let's maybe take two more um, questions. You know, we are being asked, um, you know, about the the 2020 fires, and I know a lot of people, you know, um, um, you know, want to know just a little bit about that. Do you um, want to speak about that at all, um, Gustavo? Yeah, so we all know about the 2020 fires happening in Napa, and many people think that there is no 2020 vintage, which is incorrect. Yes, the vintage will be always really small because a lot of the fruit was damaged. Some companies decided not to harvest the fruit because they had a smoke tank, but some companies harvested the fruit because the vineyard wasn't in an area adjacent to the fires. So there are good vineyards that they give us good fruit. So the vintage is there, 2020 is there. A small amounts, yes, but we have a 2020 vintage. And, and actually, I have to say that the damage is, the, the fires damage the vintage, but it could be one of the best vintage that we ever had. It's I just the fires, that. but... Yeah, I, I keep that's... hearing that, you know, the wine that was produced, you know, is just incredible. Um, you know, and, and Renee, I think you made, you know, wines as well. We did, yes. I mean, clearly, this vintage was, 2020 was a challenging vintage. Um, there's there's no uh, way around that. But like Gustavo and Pine Ridge, um, we, left, we had to leave a lot of fruit out in the field, uh, which was certainly uh, not ideal. But the fruit that we brought in, I honestly, I sat down and tasted through so many of these wines now um, at, at various stages. And I am finding myself really excited about the wines that are sound. They're tasting Great. Um, I think we're going to, I think you'll all be very excited about the lines that come out for the 
2020 vintage, the ones that were made and that were sound and that we were able to bring in. So we're we're hoping and looking forward to sharing those with you. I love it. And so we have here, you know, also because we talked about some of the AVAs in detail, there's a few questions coming in about, you know, do you blend, you know, across AVAs? Do you want to talk about that, um, Renee, being a, the winemaker? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we do, um, we have our Napa Valley tier core wines. So we make a Napa Valley Cabernet and a Napa Valley Merlot. Uh, we also do a Sauvignon Blanc and a Chardonnay. And for us, the idea with that wine is really to kind of highlight the diversity of that varietal within the valley. So we will cross blend different AVAs and really kind of working with those great little pockets throughout the valley and those great sources. But what we'll do is we'll blend them to kind of give you the best representation of Napa Valley Cabernet. Um, our Hell Mountain fruit is, um, we do two bottlings from up there. They're both a state. One of them is the Hell Mountain Cabernet, and then we also make a Merlot from our Stout Vineyard. So that kind of stays, it's, it's more of an ABA um, wine. And similar to our Rutherford and Oakville, where it's about a six to 700 case small production bottling that just focuses on you know fruit from that one ABA. But we do have other wines that look at cross blending. Makes me wish it wasn't morning over here so that we could uh, enjoy a wine. <laughs> well, it's time for a glass, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I like your style. So look, I want to thank you, Renee, Gustavo, I want to thank you so much for today and that deep dive. You know, again, I think we all need to rewatch this and, 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 and again, watch these connections, you know, between these natural influences that not only affect grape growing, but also the fruit characteristics and therefore, you know, the winemaking options available. Um, and, and then all of this resulting in all these various styles of Cabernet Sauvignon. And imagine, we've touched, we went on a deep dive in just three of the AVAs. Um, I think our heads would explode if we tried to cover them all today. Um, but anyway, thank you, thank you so much um, once again for um, being on the panel. You guys are great. And I want to thank Lydia, the WSET, and Connor from the Napa Valley Vintners. Um, this has just been been a joy um, to, to have be on this session. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.